This episode of Out of the Trenches is brought to you by The Great Courses Plus, and Out of the Trenches is where I, Indy Nidell, sit here in my chair of wisdom and answer all your questions about the First World War. Sir Saladhead. Hey, we've had him before, right? Okay, hey, Sir Saladhead. Sir Saladhead writes, were there any attempts to invent smoke grenades for mortars, artillery, or infantry use? It seems providing cover with smoke for troops going over the top would have been far more effective than any creeping barrage, and there would have been much less risk of friendly fire because their detonation would be much smaller. The smoke bomb was developed in the middle of the 19th century, and it was basically a mix of an oxidizer, some fuel, and a moderator to keep the smoke pouring, right? For the Great War, they usually mixed in some chemical dye because it was more often used as a signaling device than for actual concealment. An exception was smoke screens for warships since they would be really useful to conceal the slow-moving giants as they made their retreat. Uh, one reason why smoke screens were not used at the beginning of the war was that the observers and generals in the rear they couldn't see how the battle was unfolding. They lost sight of their troops in the smoke. And given that at that time, the chain of command from high up was much more strict, many high officers rejected the idea of smoke screens for that reason. Another reason was the bad quality of the early versions of smoke grenades, which could in the worst case cause like eye strain and breathing problems. Uh, smoke grenades of higher quality were used more extensively later in the war as infiltration tactics became uh, more common, meaning it was now practical to conceal small groups of soldiers as they approached the enemy's trenches, right? Um, we came across reports that smoke grenades were sometimes thrown alongside regular grenades since the chemicals would react and create like a sort of makeshift firebomb, right? Later in the war, smoke screens for artillery movements or for shifting larger infantry groups were more often included in standard procedure. Mitchell Pace writes, Hi Indy, my great-grandfather joined the Canadian Corps at the age of 16 and served from 1916 to the end of the war. What was the official stance on underage troops for all combatants? Were the Central Powers forced to recruit younger and younger people as the war progressed? Amazing enough, my grandfather also fought in World War II, and his diary told of him capturing soldiers as young as 14 by the end of the war. Was this true for the first? Keep up the amazing work. Two exclamation points. Keep up the amazing work! Yeah. Um, we did actually talk a little bit about this before. Like, uh, the British conscription agents did not really deeply investigate soldiers lying about their age. From 1914 to around 1917, France and Germany drafted men into the army by their school class year. So you had a pretty good idea of how old these guys were, which was around 19 or 20 years of age. That was pretty well established, and, uh, you know, younger soldiers would have a much more difficult time enlisting. Now, the tide of volunteers that overwhelmed recruiting bureaus in all of the madness of August 1914 was an exception, sure. Uh, other parts of the world were not as strict, especially where the war was fought in more rural areas like, uh, like the Balkans or the Eastern Front. Sure, you can see younger men accompany the armies more regularly. During the end phase of the war, you see a lot of younger, often malnourished German men in the Allied prison camps drafted from age 17 and up. But this was a last ditch effort, but nowhere close to the total war demands of the Third Reich, uh, the Flakhelfer generation. This is the generation of young boys serving in the Wehrmacht in the end phase of World War II was not present during World War I. The fate of boys and young men during and shortly after the war is actually quite a recent topic in historical science, right? They focus more strongly on younger men who were too young to fight but experienced the war anyway. And you can see the effects especially in the brutality of the new generation of soldiers that fought in the revolutions and conflicts after November 1918. But that is a topic for another day. Uh, Scott Weber writes, Hi, Indy. Great show. In fact, I have increased my contribution to $15. Oh, thank you. Scott Weber, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Scott Weber. 
Um, my question is, why didn't the Austro-Hungarians build their fortresses closer to the frontier? After all, they could have built fortresses near Lemberg, which is much closer to the frontier. This would seem to make more sense. Well, Scott, uh, I assume you're specifically talking about the fortress of Przemysl, which was, or is, not too far from Lemberg, and was designed to defend the frontier towards Russia. Now, you see, the principle of the fortress at the beginning of the war had its roots in the warfare of the 18th and 19th centuries. Long defensive lines like the trenches and redoubts we see in the Great War were unthought of then. A big fortress built on easily defensible terrain near a vital supply and road system was a huge barricade for any invading army. See, even if you theoretically could just take Lemberg and then advance towards the Austro-Hungarian interior, you would always have the fortress and the garrison in your back. And you'd have to commit a lot of troops to watching that. And that is exactly what happened. Uh, Conrad failed to relieve the siege of Przemysl and the fort got captured. Uh, as to your question why they simply didn't build more fortresses at the frontiers, three reasons. Uh, first, money. Uh, building and maintaining a fortress is a huge strain on your defense budget. Second, it's a double, okay? Time and politics, okay? Planning and actually building a fortress complex takes decades. And what might be a potentially exposed front line today might not be that important in the future, right? So you'd either build a lot of fortresses for all eventualities, which is not possible, or you'd commit to only a few. And third, the actual effectiveness of fortress defensive works was always highly debated. And many people favored a strong mobile field army instead of static defenses. Okay, that's it for today. Now, as I said at the beginning, this episode was sponsored by The Great Courses Plus, which is a really fantastic online learning service. And they have over 7,000 lectures on pretty much everything under the sun. And since we've just been talking about economics, one of our favorite ones, what's the specific name? Because it's economic history. But Flo, what's it actually called? An economic history of the world since 1400. An economic history of the world since 1400. Yeah, I should have been able to remember that. But it's actually really good. Now, if you don't know about this service, they have, um, they have courses taught by professors from top universities all over the world, for people from the Smithsonian, National Geographic, and it costs $14.99 a month. But you can get a trial right now. And you can start that free trial if you go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash thegreatwar or click the link in the video description. And check us out on Facebook so you can see all the cool stuff that Flo, who you can't see but I'm pointing at, puts up. See you next time.